الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ان النفس لاماره بالسوء ومن سيئات اعمالنا من جاء بالحسنه فله عشر اضعافها ومن جاء بالسيئه فلا يجزى الا مثلها الحمد لله الذي لا يحمد على مكروه سواه فاطر السماوات والارض اذا قضى امرا فانما يقول له كن فيكون واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وهو الذي في السماء رب واله يعبد ويطاع وفي الارض رب واله يعبد ويطاع قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك ممن تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير انك على كل شيء قدير واشهد ان سيدنا وعزيزنا وحبيبنا واسوتنا محمدا صلى الله عليه واله وسلم عبده ورسوله كتاب انزلناه اليك فلا يكن في قلبك حرج من لتنذر به وذكرى للمؤمنين من يطع الله ورسوله واولي الامر من المؤمنين فلا يضل ابدا ومن يعص الله ورسوله واولي الامر من المؤمنين فلا يهدى ابدا اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون احسنه معشر المؤمنين committed muslim brothers and sisters with Allah's assistance and with the information that he has entrusted us with in his book of records the holy writ we begin by quoting his words Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an nar our sustainer give us in this world the deed of perfection and the reward of perfection thereof and give us in the life to come in the end life the results of those good deeds in this world and spare us the torment 
of the fire. ربنا افتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وانت خير الفاتحين او اور سستينر grant us a breakthrough with our own people and you are the best to do so brothers and sisters as a reminder when we express the ideas in this in these khutbas we do so factoring in the issues and the themes that are meant to divide us we remind ourselves of the truth and of the validity of what we are concentrating our minds on while we take notice of the bloodshed and the warfare that are meant to capitalize on our ignorance of our own selves and for that reason we pursue the information that we have to dispel this ignorance and therefore to abort the plans and the programs that now are causing us hundreds of lives almost on a daily basis they want to stir they meaning the militaries and the government that belong to a shaytan and have no relationship to Allah they want to stir in the midst of the muslims a war that will consume the potential that we have not only to extricate ourselves from what we are in and have been in for a long time but to extend a hand of support to those who need it now where is this area that they are trying to fish for trouble in this has been our concentration for maybe the past year or more and we will continue don't think that we are saying this because we get a kick out of turning these pages of history these are times of trouble those were wars that cost us many lives it may be hard to focus our minds on these developments in our past but it's only hard for those who are not in the company of Allah and his prophet we pick off where we left off the last time around 
that was when both sides, both Muslim sides, are gearing up for a war. And we realize that Muawiyah, the governor of Asham, preceded with his troops to a place called Safin. This happens to be an area on the right hand side of the Euphrates River, Al Furat. And the army of Muawiyah set camp there in this particular area. In other words, they reach what is going to become the battlefield before the army and the camp of an Imam Ali. And it was a short time later and then an Imam Ali and those who are with him arrive. And I want you brothers and sisters to listen with your mind, please. Place your emotions to the side. You can emotionalize about this as much as you want on your own. But when this issue is potentially a divisive issue among the Muslims, what is required here is our full attention and our minds. When both of these opposing Muslim blocks of people arrive at this particular area called Safin, Muawiyah and his side were intent on denying access to the water to the side and the camp of an Imam Ali. And obviously water is a vital element, especially if a war is going to extend or skirmishes are going to extend for the time period that they did. And we're talking here almost three months. This was in the 38th year of the Hijrah. And so there was an attempt to solve this water issue. And then Imam Ali sends some interlocutors, some spokespersons to try to convince the other side that all warriors, everyone here needs to have equal access to water. Let me remind you, if you have forgotten, that water now is not a simple issue. Water now has a little background history to it. Because this side that is with Muawiyah are now trying to take revenge are trying to take revenge for the denial of water to a man in his final days if you may recall in previous khutbas we explained how when Uthman and his family were under siege they were denied water Now Muawiyah and his camp are trying a tit for tat. You denied Uthman water, now we are going to deny you water. And, of course, these folks 
persons return to Al Imam Ali with the answer that they are, meaning Muawiyah and his side are non negotiating on this matter. They want to block access to water. Now, on Muawiyah's side, there were two elements at work. There was a shura element, even though that was only a mechanism, and there was the asabiyya element, the element of nationalism that was always at work. It was at work in Mecca when the Prophet was there, it was at work in Al Medina when the Prophet was there, it was at work during the time of the successors to the Prophet Abi Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. And now it is at work within Muawiyah's camp. In opposition to this opinion, one of Muawiyah's lieutenants, Amr ibn al As, advised Muawiyah that you should not deny the other side access to Al-Furat, to the water, because this encounter between us and them, meaning between Muawiyah's side and Imam Ali's side, may take a long time. And we don't want to begin a war with them immediately. But if you deny them this water, you will be forcing them to go all out against us very quick. But still, putting this shura aside, Muawiyah adopted the asabiyyah of Bani Umayyah around him, which said, we insist we are dead serious about preventing the other side from having access to water. And so what happened here was a, a very serious skirmish between the two sides. And this was in the last month of the 37th year of the Hijrah in the Hijjah. And as a result, the camp of the Imam Ali managed to now take control of the water access to Al Furat. Now the whole issue was reversed. The camp of the Imam Ali now had access to Al Furat and Muawiyah and his camp did not have any access to it. And there were those who were on the side of an Imam Ali who took a hard position saying that now that we are in control, we are not going to have them draw from this water. But an Imam Ali as a matter of principle said no. Then what's the difference between us and them? This water is for all. And we will have access to it, and they will have access to it. And then, the month of Al-Muharram arrives, the 38th year of the Hijrah. And there were mutual feelings on both sides to try to talk this thing through. Let us try to settle this issue short of war. And during this month of Al-Muharram, the whole month was spent in intensive, nervous, and hard talk between both sides. Argument flaring up of nerves. There was no warfare. It was just 
a serious back and forth verbal war between both sides. And it wasn't going anywhere. Both sides into the month of Safar after Al Muharram realized that this is becoming a stalemate. There's not going to be a decisive decision that's going to come out of this through this medium of both sides clinging to the positions that we outlined in the previous khutbah or two. No one wanted to budge an inch on their positions. The positions summarized in one side being Al-Fi'ah Al-Baghiyah and that is Muawiyah and the other side being the one that is failing to apply the Qisas to the killers of Uthman and that is the camp of Imam Ali. These were the two bedrock, hard rock positions of the two antagonized sides. And then, when the Imam Ali exhausted the means here of trying to solve this issue short of an all-out military encounter, he put his army on a war footing in combat formation to take on the other side. Muawiyah realized now that his opponents were ready for the real thing. Meaning the military, the all out military encounter between both sides. So he also put his forces in warfare formation. And the first day that they began this war, it was tribe against tribe, one tribe from this side against another tribe from that side, or one man from this side against another man from that side, or one squadron from one side against another squadron from the other side. And war continued like this for the first day. Remember now we're almost two months or two and a half months since both sides encamped at Safin. This is a long period. And then on the second day, both armies met in mass. And they began dueling. This is very sad to comment upon when we are speaking about tens of thousands of Muslims who now are going to be killed. But there's a matter of principle here, we remind you. And there's a matter, matter of political expediency here. In this second day of fierce warfare, the right flank of Imam Ali's forces caved in. Meaning now there was a gap in the right flank and the forces of the other side began to move into this gap. And that Imam Ali was forced to go from the middle of this armed force to the left flank. And then the fighting intensified. And it intensified. And what was managed during these critical times was the regrouping of the right flank of an Imam Ali under the command of Al-Ashtar al nakhai who 
who in today's word was a hardcore military personality who didn't see any gray areas in this affair. And as the day went on, the camp and the armed forces of the Imam solidified their positions and then the war continued throughout the night. This is unusual. We don't know of any warfare extending from the first day to the second day and then from the second day into the second night and then from the second night into the third day. And the casualties were tremendous. On that third day, the camps or the armed forces of Muawiyah felt that now they are going to be defeated. Now brothers and sisters, before I go on, I just want you, and I'm trying to as conscientiously as possible, express these delicate historical affairs. Does anyone feel any hatred? You can see someone right and you can see someone wrong. But can anyone feel any hatred toward another Muslim because of this? And I think the answer is obvious. On the third day, when the routing or the defeat of the counter Imam Ali forces was imminent, then all of a sudden they raised the Masahif. They raised the written Quran on their spears and their swords. Most of it was on the spears. And they called for an arbitration. They said, Kitabullahi baynana wa baynakum min fatihatihi ila khatimatihi. Allah Allah fil Arab. Allah Allah fil Islam. Allah Allah fil Suhoor. من لثغور الشام إذا هلك أهل الشام من لثغور العراق إذا تفانى أهل العراق These were the exact words that were expressed during this military maneuver. What was the impact of this on their opposing side. Many of the warriors on the side of an Imam Ali took a maybe what can be described as an emotional response to this. They said now our enemies want to arbitrate this difference. And they want to do so according to the Qur'an. Why should we refuse this offer? This was the majority opinion among those who were with Al-Imam Ali. There was a lesser opinion that said, no, we are sure of our position. We have been sure of our position from the first day or else we wouldn't have been in this war that we are in now. We are sure that our leader is Amirul Mu'mineen. And we are sure that our opponents are Al-Fi'ah Al-Baghiyah, the offending, aggressive, 
category of people. And then this became now, listen brothers and sisters, with your emotions aside, this now became a divisive issue inside the camp of an Imam Ali. It became so divisive that some of an Imam Ali's own people threatened him because he didn't agree with the idea that there should be an arbitration. He said raising the Mus'haf is nothing new. Remember when the clash in Al-Basra took place at Al-Jamal. Remember when an Imam Ali asked, and we mentioned this in a previous khutbah, he asked for a volunteer who would go and raise the Qur'an to arbitrate this affair according to the Book of Allah. But before the war began, there's a difference here. He wanted the arbitration of this affair in Al-Basra before Al-Jamal and the casualties and the victims and the war dead at Al-Jamal. But these now are raising these masahif not because they are sincere about an arbitration but because they see that they are losing. It's a trick. But those who are with him, most of those who are with him, they could not reconcile this to themselves. They couldn't see this as a trick. So they insisted on it. Some of them even told Al-Imam Ali, if you are not going to accept this arbitration, we ourselves are going to turn you over to Muawiyah. What do you do? What do you do when most of the people who are with you now see that the best thing to do is to refer this whole issue to the Book of Allah when those who are asking for this referral are not sincere, are doing this to escape an imminent military defeat. So Imam Ali was forced, more or less, was forced into this arbitration. Now what are the armed forces that we are talking about here on both sides? If anyone comes to you with a firm answer on this, dismiss it. The, the books of history give different numbers. Some of them say an Imam Ali's forces numbered around a hundred thousand and Muawiyah's forces numbered around seventy five thousand and then you have the numbers going up or down and then you have the casualties brothers and sisters this is a sad day among us we the Muslims the casualties were and here again, you have different numbers, but we can put out there a number that we feel somewhat comfortable with. You may add a little or take a little from it. Those who were killed from Muawiyah's side were about 45,000. And those who were killed from an Imam Ali's side were around 25,000. So we have a total casualty figure of 70,000 Muslims, give or take some thousands depending on the historian you are reading. But in that area, who were killed during this military encounter at Safin. What is important to realize here is that This was a war unlike other wars. Remember they spent months yelling or shouting their impressions or their ideas against each other. Even during the nights 
when they were discussing this affair in the month of Muharram, both sides would meet during the evenings and late into the night, speaking to each other, formulating poetry. But the outcome of all of this was a sad bloodletting in our history. No one can deny this. And some of the most prominent people were killed in this war. Only to mention one from each side. One of those who were killed on Muawiyah's side was Ubaidullah ibn Umar. The one who killed Al-Hurmuzan. Remember when Umar was assassinated in the masjid and his, his son took the law into his own hands and in revenge killed those he said were responsible for killing his father. This Ubaidullah ibn Umar was killed at Safin. On the other side, we had Ammar ibn Yasser who was killed at Safin. And Ammar ibn Yasir demands some minutes of our time because he is pivotal because of the Prophet in defining the right side from the wrong side. All Muslims agree that the Prophet said to Ammar, وَيْحَكَ إِبْنَ سُمَيَّةِ تَقْتُلُكَ الْفِئَةُ الْبَاغِيَةِ Pity you, the son of Sumayya, you are going to be killed by the offending side. And what happened in the course of this war, Obviously was Ammar was on the side of an Imam Ali. Ammar was over 90 years old. Those were his physical years. But his mental and his spiritual and his motivational years were very young. He didn't show any feature of being an elderly person as he came voluntarily with his own initiative to this encounter. There was a person by the name of Khuzayma al-Ansari, Ibn Thabit al-Ansari, who tagged on, listen to this, he tagged on to the camp of an Imam Ali. He was just there as a person he didn't want to fight. He was watching Ammar very closely. And when Ammar was killed, he said, this Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari said, Now, the truth is obvious. And at that moment he took arms and he fought until he was killed. And the killing of Ammar became a problem to Muawiyah. Because Muawiyah and those who were with him obviously knew the Prophet's hadith concerning Ammar. And it was an embarrassment to them. So they tried to look the other way. They tried to make believe this whole thing didn't happen. But no one could bury an issue like this. So it was brought to the attention of Muawiyah. They said, the Prophet said, how do you explain the Prophet's words? وَيْحَكَ إِبْنَ سُمَيَّةَ تَقْتُلُكَ الْفِئَةُ الْبَاغِيَةِ How do you explain that? He said, أَنَحْنُ قَتَلْنَا Did we kill him? This is a question that infers 
negating the killing of Ammar. إنما قتله الذين جاءوا به. He said, the ones who killed him are the ones who who brought him to the war front. No one brought Ammar. Ammar wasn't forced into a war. He came there of his own volition, of his own free will. And if Muawiyah's logic stands, then we could say that the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was the one who killed Hamza. Because it was the Prophet who was instrumental in bringing Hamza to the war front. But obviously, that's a contorted, twisted logic. It doesn't stand the truth of the matter. Ammar was killed. And Ammar was the one, upon seeing Amr ibn al-As on the other side of the battlefield, said, This is not the first time I encounter him in war. This is the fourth time. There were three other times that we fought on different sides of the war front. And Ammar was the one who said, نَحْنُ ضَرَبْنَاكُمْ عَلَى تَنْزِيلَهِ وَالْيَوْمَ نَضْرِبُكُمْ عَلَى تَأْوِيلَهِ ضَرْبًا يُزِيلُ الْهَامَ عَنْ مَقِيلَهِ وَيُنْهِ الْخَلِيلَ عَنْ خَلِيلَهِ أَوْ يَرْجِعَ الْحَقُّ إِلَى سَبِيلَهِ It was obvious at this time, by any standards, that there was an offending and an aggressive and a violating camp, and that was the camp of Muawiyah. But brothers and sisters, even if we say this, and the truth has to be said, This doesn't generate any hatred towards Muslims. You can disagree with someone, you can disagree with someone all the way to the war front. But does that mean you're going to hate the rest of the Muslims? Where did this come from? How did this occur? And finally now, we reach the issue of التحكيم the arbitration and we will find the way this arbitration went when they asked when Imam Ali sent some emissaries to Muawi and said okay what is it now that you mean by this arbitration and Imam Ali reluctantly accepted this because most of the people who were with him accepted it Now, he had to clarify what the other side wants from this arbitration. What do you want? And Muawiyah says to these emissaries, we appoint one interlocutor or one arbiter from our side, and you do the same from your side. And they will solve this issue in reference to the book of Allah. And what we will see in the coming khutbah, we will see how this arbitration unfolded. And how, even though Muawiyah appointed Amr ibn al-As to represent his side, how On the side of Imam Ali, it wasn't per se Imam Ali who appointed the arbiter. It was public opinion on his side that that agreed that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari should represent that side, even though Abu Musa al-Ash'ari 
was not a participant in this war between the Muslims. We will take a closer look at these unfolding events just as we have taken a look at the preceding events and we will realize out of it there is not a matter of hatred. There is not a matter of animus among the Muslims. This hatred and this animus comes from the outsiders. And let me remind you at that time there were outsiders. You think the Byzantines who had just lost or were in the process of losing their empire and the Persians who were in the process of losing their empire, both of them were not looking at these Muslims now consuming their own lives and not any lives. The, gener the first generation and the second generation of Muslims, they had their military plans and they were willing and they were watching for a comeback if the Muslims gave them that opportunity and if the hatred and the animus would have consumed the Muslims at that time, the foreign enemies would have had a chance to make a military comeback against the Muslims. They didn't do it at that time and no Muslim should think about doing it today. We are Muslims in this altogether, and there's no room for this division that is being instigated from the outside, and that is being verbalized from the inside. Allahumma ja'alna min al-ladheena yastami'oona al-qawl, fayattabi'oona ahsana. Rabbana aftah baynana wa bayna qawmina bilhaq. وأنت خير الفاتحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ادعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب وإليه المصير ادعوه وأنتم موقنون بالإجابة الحمد لله الذي هداه وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أولي النهى والتقى Brothers and sisters committed Muslims It is very difficult Believe me it is very difficult for a Muslim to recount and recall the details of those defining times. It is very sad to think of what happened, but the fact is that it did happen. And there shouldn't be any hostilities that turn into warfare nowadays because of what happened at that time. Are we not able to learn from ourselves? And can you learn when you're agitated? Can you learn when you are nervous? Can you learn when you are emotionally unstable. You can't. And they were there to help us learn. The side of an Imam Ali that we were talking about, they were before the division that we are going to be looking at. They were the ones who were at that time in the middle of these battles. They were repeating and recalling the Prophet's statement. أَلَسْتُ أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ 
Am I not a priority that supersedes the selves of the committed Muslims? And they all responded affirmatively. Qalu bala. And then he took the hand of an Imam Ali and he said, Man kuntu mawlah, fahadha aliyun mawlah. Allahumma wali man walah, wa'adi man adah. This hadith, I think, is known by every Muslim. Okay, so when you, you Muslim, whoever you are, when you say this Muslim, do you feel any animus towards another Muslim? Remember these people who were fighting with an Imam Ali, who were saying these words. And who are saying the ayah in the Quran, and Nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim. And who are saying, Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah wa rasoolah. Qul in kana abaukum, wa abnaukum, wa ikhwanukum, wa azwajukum, wa ashiratukum, wa amwalun iqtaraftumuha, wa tijaratun takshawna kasadaha. ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين They were repeating these words They were meeting with their Let's call them enemies They were meeting with their enemies but they didn't, And they were heated in their discussions but they didn't show any hatred or any animosity where did this come from it doesn't belong in the Muslim heart or mind then and it doesn't belong in the Muslim heart or mind now there's something that is right and there's something that is wrong we identify what is right and we identify what is wrong and we move forward all together this is the correct character of a committed Muslim. Not the type of Sunnis and Shi'is today who are stoking the fires of sectarianism. One of, it, it appears now, one of the qualifications for a Muslim scholar to come to the United States, if he is a Sunni, to speak against Shi'is. If he's a Shi'i, to speak against Sunnis. This is where we find ourselves now. So who is behind this Sunni Shi'i sectarianism? I leave it to your common sense. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna attiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatilan warzuqna ajtinaba wa la taj'alhu multabisan alayna wa ja'alna lil-muttaqeen imama ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد ربنا صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا بارك على محمد وآل محمد ربنا صل على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم ربنا بارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم 
إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون يعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوفا الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله